President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you the President of Ireland, my President, uh, who I'm very pleased to welcome to the London School of Economics. Um, the President, Mary McAleese, is somebody who is greatly respected and admired in Ireland. After a long period as president, some 11 years, she has endeared herself to Irish people, both north and south. She took as the theme of her presidency, building bridges. And she has been building bridges ever since she took up her position. Building bridges between people in the south, between the advantaged and the disadvantaged, between the communities, both communities in Northern Ireland. And she has made a very considerable contribution to the Ireland of today. A com contribution of tolerance and moderation, a contribution of belief in other people and in belief and communication. Her subject this evening, Ireland and Britain, Old Narratives and New, is particularly appropriate having regard to this theme of her presidency. Her own academic background as a Reed Professor of Law in the University of Dublin and Trinity College, followed by uh, a period as Pro-Chancellor, having previously directed the law school in, in Queen's University in Belfast is testimony to her abilities as an academic. But apart from that, her abilities as a person are the endearing feature that I've already described. Hopefully, the bad days of Ireland are behind us. I think it was Louis McNeese, the poet from Northern Ireland, who made a comment about a land of morose vendettas. We hope that those morose vendettas are behind us and that advances made as recently, hopefully as today, will have their effect in making Ireland the place that we Irish people all want it to be, a place of tolerance and moderation. So here we have a president born and brought up in Belfast whose family was touched by the events of which we are all aware and regret so much, who has come to LSE, which itself is a haven of tolerance, moderation, and, the up and also debate. And she's very kindly come to be with us this evening, and I have great pleasure in welcoming her and asking her to take the floor. Good evening, Chairman of LSE, members of the Council, Court of Governors of LSE, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and thank you. Thank you for that lovely warm welcome. It's good to see so many of you here. And thank you also for the chance to be here, uh, to share with you uh, just some reflections on um, what is an extraordinary changing uh, set of narratives uh, in the story of Ireland and Britain. LSE plays a very distinguished role in those narratives. Uh, it actually plays a role, a very important role in both stories, uh, from, of course, um, LSE's, I think, still relatively new distinguished chairman, Peter Sutherland, um, one of Ireland's uh, most distinguished uh, great ambassadors, um, to LSE's co-founder, well over a century ago, the famous uh, Fabian and Dubliner, sometimes forgotten that he's a Dubliner, George Bernard Shaw, um, actually, Shaw's passion for this place has always confused me a little bit, uh, given his absolutely legendary contempt for formal education and teachers. Uh, it says something, it says something about LSE that he didn't include in LSE um, in any of that, in any of that contempt, indeed went to a lot of bother to establish this place for whom it was, a, and for him it was a passion. Uh, his imprint is evident in many ways in this place today, and the uh, famous, um, Fabian window, which he designed, that adorns, of course, the Shaw Library. So uh, the story 
really, in some ways, we're looking at the story of the relations between um, Shaw's two homelands, his, uh, the homeland of his birth, Ireland, and his adopted homeland, Britain. And frankly, the stories, uh, or the story of, of that relationship could keep an academy of historians uh, busy for the rest of the century. It'll probably keep many of you busy uh, for the rest of this century and probably the rest of your lives. Uh, just recently, on television, we had a television documentary on Oliver Cromwell, and it showed up with, pretty starkly, I would have thought, some of the difficulties that we encounter when we attempt to talk about particular aspects of history, um, but from very, very different perspectives. To many people here in Britain, Cromwell is a reforming figure, a heroic figure, the first Republican, a great visionary, uh, particularly in terms of the separation of church and state. In Ireland, the story is a little bit different. Um, <laughs> to put it as diplomatically as possible, um, he is seen in, not entirely unreasonably as a violent and hate-filled oppressor. Um, there is some considerable distance, you will agree, between those two perspectives. And um, what is true of attitudes to Cromwell is replicated in many, many, many other scenarios. For although our narratives are intertwined, they're interlaced, they're interwoven, they're wrapped around each other so tightly, they're not the same. The colonizer and the colonized do not tell the same story. Even if they try to tell the same story, they don't tell it the same way. And they don't have the same story to tell. And sometimes our geographic closeness, our regular engagement with one another can create a kind of a false illusion, a false impression that we do know one another. After all, we live next door to one another. Of course, we know the neighbors very well. Um, uh, and we think that that intimacy of being next door um, confers on us some way or another some deep penetrating insight into our neighbor's thinking. Um, I have to say, as somebody who grew up in Belfast, um, cheek by jowl, um, running in and out of neighbors' houses um, in a mixed community, um, in fact, as, as a Catholic growing up in a Protestant area of Belfast, I would have to put my hand up today and say that sometimes we have an extraordinary capacity for not revealing ourselves to each other, even in what appears to be the most intimate of connections. And so it's a dangerous impression that the neighbors think they know one another. Um, and for that reason, we often actually have seemed quite incomprehensible at times also to one another. When we have said things or behaved in certain ways, we've thought, why do they do that? They're not supposed to behave like that. That's not how they're supposed to get on. I thought I knew these people. It's as if the light from one prism blinds the other, the light from the other. And yet happily, thankfully, in this generation, we are able to say, nothing stays the same. Not even righteous resentment at the long, sorry mess of colonialism and plantation. It was Irish historian um, Oliver McDonough who said, I think, one of the most famous aphorisms. I'm sure Shaw would have been delighted to have said it himself. He said, the Irish do not forget and the English do not remember. Um, so, and then we wonder why we are mutually incomprehensible. Um, and yet in this generation, actually, I don't think that that is really any longer true. Um, in recent decades, at both political level and at the level of human, just everyday human intercourse, the level of people talking to people, we have, I think, both struggled very courageously to revisit our respective narratives, to look more curiously and more respectfully um, at each other's narratives, and to develop, to consciously develop much warmer uh, much, much warmer relationships, much more respectful relationships as a bulwark against the violence and the contempt that were history's bitter legacy and that outcropped so often and caused so much dreadful hurt and loss. There have, I think, been many episodes that kind of showcased the new mood, uh, the remarkable work. I think of the absolutely extraordinary work of reconciliation taken on by the parents of Warrington victim Tim Perry who was killed in an IRA bomb uh, along with another, uh, he's only a little fellow, killed along with another little fellow, Jonathan Ball. And that's at one level. You know, people who should have been consumed with bitterness, but did not let the bitterness over 
overcome, consume and overwhelm them and asked questions about how could this occur, why could this occur, and started to penetrate the hatred that lay behind these things, the lack of information about one another that lay behind them. And they've done such extraordinary work in reconciliation. At another level entirely, um, I think of the welcome accorded to the English rugby team. Now, they've always been welcome to Lansdowne Road, don't get me wrong, particularly when we beat them, but no, they're, no, they've always, they're always welcome any time. Last year, as it happened, they played in Croke Park, which is more associated with the Irish National Games. It's the home of our Gaelic Athletic Association. Um, uh, more importantly, it is a place where in 1920, British troops entered the stadium in the middle of a football match between Dublin and Tipperary, if I remember rightly. Am I right historically, Jim? I think it's Dublin and Tipperary. Um, and um, they opened fire on spectators and players alike. Uh, killing, uh, as a result of that, 14 people died, including, including two youngsters not that much separated in age from Jonathan Ball and Tim Parry. You can imagine the legacy of bitterness that left, but what was very important was when, they, when the English team came onto the field, there were 82,000 people there that day who really wanted to be there, and they wanted to be there to show that history was behind us. They wanted to show a welcome, and they showed an absolutely extraordinary welcome on that day to the team, to their anthem. It was one of those very special, iconic days. And luckily that all happened at the start of the match, so we can't say that it was the fact that we beat them that put all this, you know, <laughs> lovely ecumenism in our hearts. It certainly helped the mood afterwards, that is for sure. But no, the showcase of what was in people's hearts came much earlier in the day when we firmly expected we would be beaten, actually, as we normally are. So there is... So there is no possibly, I think, better showcase in many ways of the new dynamic that is emerging between us and in the way in which we are both re-remembering and choosing perhaps um, not to forget things. Um, as I think particularly evident in the way in which Ireland's long overlooked but really very considerable contribution to the First World War has been brought into contemporary focus. It's a hidden history, once described to me by someone um, at, a, at a reception with the Dublin Fusiliers, someone who was telling me about their grandfather who had taken part in that war, and he said when his father returned home, his memory and all his little bits and pieces, actually, I beg your pardon, when his father did not return home, because like so many, he died um, in that war, that what they had was a shoebox of memories that they consigned to the attic, never to be spoken about again, a dreadfully ignominious place, it seems to me, for such nobility of character. And that hidden history, happily, has refused to settle in all those shoeboxes in attics. And it's a place that it was very conveniently assigned to by both Irish nationalist and British unionist because, of course, it contradicted both of their desires and their protected, their hermetically sealed narratives. In recent years, thanks to the work of a number of very passionate champions, both in Ireland and Britain, we've been successfully reminded of the extent of Ireland's contribution um, to the so-called Great War. And in the retelling, we've discovered now a set of shared memories that are capable of truly aiding the work of reconciliation and of ending sectarian division. Uh, ten years ago, um, an island of Ireland peace park dedicated to the Irish who died during uh, that war was opened at Messine in Belgium by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, by King Albert of the Belgians and myself. Since that time, um, there has been a beautiful restoration of Dublin's memorial gardens. Um, they were first re um, set out by Lutyens back in 1931. They had fallen into disrepair, now beautifully restored and only a few weeks ago, um, Martin, my husband, and I were in Castle Bar in County Mayo for the opening there of a magnificent memorial, truly beautiful memorial, to the Mayo men who died in that war. And from a small island of just then four million people, uh, whose youth had already hemorrhaged away relentlessly for generations through uh, forced emigration, through poverty, Ireland sent 200,000 volunteers to that war, not conscripts, volunteers, of whom almost 50,000 did not come home. The vast majority, contrary to popular myth, um, 
were Catholics from south of the border. Uh, there was no border then, but south of what subsequently became the border. And they fought side by side, southern and northern Protestants, northern Catholics, dissenters. They fought together, north and south. Whatever their background, whatever their persuasion, they fought side by side. With the exception, of course, of the Ulster Protestants, who comprise a sizable contingent, the vast majority, though, were Irish nationalists, and they believed that in being there and serving with the forces of the British Crown, that their desire for home rule would be conceded by a grateful British government. Meanwhile, their Unionist Protestant counterparts hoped that their loyal service would be rewarded with the withholding of home rule. And Thomas Kettle, of course, that great Irish nationalist poet and scholar who died at the Somme, had this to say. It's a phrase that any of you who visit Messine will see etched there. He says, used with the wisdom which is sown in tears and blood, this tragedy of Europe may be and must be the prologue to the two reconciliations of which all statesmen have dreamed, the reconciliation of Protestant Ulster with Ireland and the reconciliation of Ireland with Great Britain. It's been one hell of a long prologue. It's been a very long prologue with more tears and more blood. For regrettably, of course, that reconciliation so heartfeltly desired took many more decades and many more lives before it began to be accomplished. Thankfully, we can now say we are well on the way to those twin reconciliations, though we have to see it as a process rather than a, a one-day event. And so again, it constantly needs careful nurturing, careful attention. And one of the most crucial chapters in that process has been the growing collegiality in the relationship between, at particularly at political level, between Britain and Ireland. At the everyday level, the peoples of the two places have always got on very well together. They've mixed and matched. Sometimes, of course, they go about with rather unsympathetic mutual stereotypes. But for the most part, they get on well together and are capable of bantering each other and enjoying each other's company, intermixing, marrying into one another's families, doing all the kinds of things that neighbours generally do. Among Ireland citizens today, uh, there is a very substantial group of people born in Great Britain, and the reverse, of course, is also true. And it's in their lived lives, the lived lives of so many human beings, women, children, men, who have really between them created this remarkable network, this often underestimated network of family, of kin, of clan, of friendship, of mutuality, of mutual interrogation, mutual understanding, also of mutual love, sometimes words that politicians don't like to use too often, things that keep us deeply in each other's orbit. At the political level, however, what was once quite a fraught relationship, sure, certainly for the, a good part of my early life, was a very fraught relationship, thanks to absolutely exemplary leadership. It, that has become a very warm and manifestly successful relationship, particularly if we look at one of the downstream consequences of the changing temper between the two governments, which is that the peace process itself, born out of that changing temper, and the cascade effect of that, that um, more empathetic and more respectful engagement, uh, the witnessing, the inspiration that it gives to others simply can never, ever, ever be talked too much up because it's a very, very important dynamic. The psychological, the practical impact of manifestly cordial and respectful mutual relationships at the highest level undoubtedly help to create at a broader level the climate in which the Good Friday Agreement and later the St Andrews Agreement were successfully negotiated. They had impacts right around swathes and swathes of people's thinking. It's been fascinating actually to note just how powerful a tool for change has been the increasingly sensitive use of language. Insensitive language sends people scurrying back into their caves. Sensitive language draws them out makes them want to engage. And where there is an evident awareness um, of the otherness of others, and especially a kind of a, a decent sensitivity around their most neuralgic issues, 
um, efforts made to be inclusive rather than rigidly partisan. These things have really quite remarkable effects as a human dynamic. They, they really can turn hardened hearts into much, much softer hearts. And these things have contributed enormously to opening up space in people's hearts and minds, allowing those seeds of compromise that anger and hurt and resentment and contempt kind of close up and swallow up the space for and But those, that more respectful language is an opening language and it helps the possibility of forgiveness and reconciliation to happen and to flourish. These things have helped us to move on individually and, and collectively. They allowed for what um, our former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern called the triumph of common interests over inherited divisions. Today, thanks to our partnership in Europe, which actually set the scene, you know, the colonizer and the colonized sat down as equals around the same table. They got to know one another over the last 35 years of membership. They got to like one another. They share a common language. They began to see just how much they had in common. And they got on and they liked each other. And now, thankfully, thanks to that partnership, thanks then to the offspring of that partnership, the peace process in Northern Ireland, thanks to the agreed legal structures that tumbled out of all that, which supports all those interests, the paradigm now that we address each other in uh, and deal with each other in has altered way, way beyond recognition. It has matured sufficiently to allow us to live very comfortably in a very relaxed way with the inevitable areas of difference and of policy that will occur among sovereign states who have to look, over, look after their own sovereign interests. But we can do that now without any threat of breakdown. You know, you can, you can have a a difference of opinion, but be sharing a meal half an hour later or sharing a meeting. And of course, without interrupting the absolutely valuable work that we do best together, whether it's on a global stage, whether it's closer to home, whether it is nurturing that peace process. The straightening out of our relationship with uh, Great Britain was an absolutely necessary prelude to straightening out a number of other very skewed relationships. It was like taking a rope that was twisted very tightly, starting to, un, you know, to, to unravel the strands of it. And as we unraveled the strands, other things began to straighten out. Cross-border relationships and the north-south axis in between, uh, on the island of Ireland, very skewed. So much mistrust, so much uh, distrust. And then, of course, within Northern Ireland, the most skewed of all, uh, the cross-community relationship within Northern Ireland between those of Irish nationalist Catholic background, those of British Unionist Protestant background, to use those very loose, rough um, stereotypes. The Good Friday Agreement, of course, has set up structures now in which all of those relationships kind of rest um, and, and are now actively helped to grow more healthy, to grow more mutually beneficial. We don't just let them drift. They now have shape and context. On the cross-border axis, we have been witnesses to increased dialogue, considerable cooperation, um, uh, huge cooperation now, uh, north-south. Probably best exemplified by things like um, the iconic days, the meetings between former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern and former First Minister Dr Ian Paisley. Um, who met at the site, famous site of the Battle of the Boyne, happily not for the exchange of unfriendly fire, uh, but for the exchange of presents and gifts and handshakes. And um, I mean, that, the, the, it was the exchange of unfriendly fire 300 years ago that really set the islands, Catholics and Protestants, pretty much at each other's throats uh, for a very long time. And it's very interesting just how long the impact of that, of that time lasted. And we just hope that the good seed scattered by that more recent visitation to the Boyne enjoys every bit as long a shelf life um, as the seeds that were scattered back in 1690. Um, I've often thought that that day, uh, ironically, and I hope I'm not talking to too many PhD historians here, but I possibly am, um, or social scientists, but that one day did more for community relationships um, and for helping them to gel than probably a whole library full of PhDs on how to resolve conflicts. Um, and yet, of course, uh, it would be wrong to just make that jump because so much of the scholarly research 
um, that has been done in recent years, including here, was needed in order to prise open and to help us safely start to unpackage each other's and to unpack each other's narrative, helped by really good scholarship telling stories more accurately. Naturally, in the unraveling of, of that, that rope that we were always hanging ourselves with, um, it was always going to be the case that the relationship within Northern Ireland would be, would be the most difficult to set to rights. Years of conflict, loss, hurt, had created such a deep reservoir within the community of a deep sense of victimhood, deep, deep sense of mutual dislike, so overcoming those deep-rooted sectarian attitudes and differences of political ambition um, seeded so many years ago, as I said, with a shelf, with toxic seed with a very long shelf life, that was going to be difficult. And yet again, we found that there were always courageous people, um, hugely uh, devoted to reconciliation, um, who have succeeded now in over very, very lean and fallow times, creating conditions in which we now have a raft of civil and human right protections within the Good Friday Agreement and ancillary legislation that allow and make it absolutely crystal clear that every single person, every single citizen in Northern Ireland is entitled to equal respect, equal dignity, equal vindication, regardless of their political ambitions, their ethnic background, their faith system, their politics, whatever. So, um, whether they see themselves as Irish or British or an amalgam of both or whatever, every one of them regarded to equal respect, re entitled to equal respect. But as Shaw remarked himself, um, peace is not only better than war, but it is infinitely more arduous. That's something that we have learnt from first principles, that um, in order to build this thing called peace, this innocuous word called peace is a very, very, very difficult phenomenon. But we now have in place a unique system of shared government where once very, very bitter enemies now are in partnership in government. They clearly haven't found that easy. It is not easy to transcend all those differences. Why would it be? Any coalition government finds huge difficulties. They are grappling with some very contentious issues uh, from uh, support for the Irish language education reform, devolution of policing, uh, the ongoing failure of loyalists to decommission, the worry of dissident republican violence, not to mention all the other things that are absorbing governments all over the globe, like rising unemployment, recession, the fault lines in the global economy, the international financial system, to name just a few. And so they have a very, very challenging agenda. And, of course, they also know very, very well that their context, having come so recently from a very volatile context, they know just how much effort has gone into constructing this, is a, this very innocuous thing that we call peace, but which um, really the word peace is such an anemic sounding word, it really doesn't get close. It's the kind of thing that once you've lost it and you try to construct it, you begin to realize just how extraordinarily complex a human phenomenon it is. It takes immense will of the people and equally immense efforts over a very long time of politicians but now we have the new dispensation. And it's a very important buffer against sliding back. You know, The Sisyphus stone is just always there. And every citizen's hope rests now that that stone is not going to roll back down, that we should continue to see the fruits of this partnership, this drive for peace. And for that reason, of course, um, I, like Peter, am very happy with the recent developments, very positive developments in Northern Ireland with First Minister Peter Robinson and Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness announcing, thankfully, a breakthrough on what has been a very difficult issue, and that is the issue of devolving policing and justice to Northern Ireland. And they've managed to get a breakthrough, which allows now for the resumption of government. Uh, many of you who are followers of Northern Ireland may know that, the, that their government has not actually met for the last five months. It meets tomorrow, thankfully. And we're delighted to see that that spirit of partnership now is gaining traction and momentum once again. And very encouraging also to hear Taoiseach Brian Cowan uh, describing this as the last piece in the jigsaw puzzle. And that's a very, very encouraging moment to have arrived at in Irish and British history. Here in Britain, we know that there is much that we can learn uh, from the stories of the many Irish immigrants who made their lives here, contributing 
enormously to the enrichment of this society, contributing at every level of civic and political and economic and cultural life. Um, I think they teach us something about identity and about sometimes its false vanities. Because, of course, those who came would have come as Irish men and women. Their children born here will have gr grown up as British, British and Irish, an amalgam, a mixture, a terrible thing to make people opt or plump. That was always the way we used to do things. Now I think we look at things more broadly and we say what a wonderful thing to have two wonderful reservoirs, two such rich and deep reservoirs to draw all your inspiration from, all your sense of self from. And so today, instead of ransacking history, which we did for a long time, both of us, to find evidence of each other's perfidy, I think we now look at history quite differently. We look to it to tell us stories more accurately, to draw from it a store of new shared memories, and to gather up all the old shared memories to fill in more accurately that jigsaw puzzle of our relationships. I think we want now, we have a hunger to see things more clearly and more generously. Our people have surely been weaving um, a tapestry, a shared tapestry for millennia, inevitably, as neighbours would. Um, I think that probably one of its most exciting and colourful panels is now being crafted in this generation, the most egalitarian, the most educated in both our countries. I won't rehearse, because it would sound less than humble, um, I won't rehearse the Irish and Britain's contribution to the world of literature or sport or music or film or education, commerce. I don't need to do it with Peter Sutherland sitting beside me anyway as the chair of LSE. Um, but in deference um, to that other great love of Shaw's, I might just, the, which was the world of politics, um, I'd just like to point out that there are over 100 MPs in Westminster of Irish background. That's an extraordinary number. And they follow in the footsteps of Irishmen in Britain who were among the high among the most outstanding of European and international statesmen. I think of Daniel O'Connell, the champion of Catholic emancipation, but more importantly, not just Catholic emancipation, the champion of emancipation of people whose dignity was trampled on anywhere in the world. And it was his broad contribution that helped to steer Britain along the path to egalitarian democracy. And very often, of course, that story of his contribution is, you know, not part of a, a narrative people want to accept or acknowledge, but so often overlooked. Wellington, for our part, not one that we want to acknowledge sometimes either. Wellington, who just happened, thankfully, to be in government for that short window of opportunity, and who, as an Irishman, however reluctantly, um, I won't bother with the quote, you all know it off by heart, but... Um, However reluctantly, in those short months that he was Prime Minister, from his understanding of Ireland, he knew how important Catholic emancipation was and would be. And so that remarkable confluence allowed for the granting of Catholic emancipation. But it had very far-reaching consequences because really it was part of the growth of a rights-based concept of the human dignity of the human person, the equality of the human person, rather than concessions given, dribbled out to the masses, here were people saying, this is actually a human right, this is a civil right, this is not something you withhold at your pleasure or give at your pleasure. This is something that is intrinsic to the human person. I think of Edmund Burke, whose maiden speech in the House of Commons was so eloquent that William Pitt the Elder said he had spoken in such a manner as to stop all the mouths of Europe. Obviously, that was a slight exaggeration because it didn't actually do that, but um, clearly he had a very high opinion of him, just as Gladstone reckoned that Parnell was the most remarkable human being he had ever met. So, in truth, we have always been very, very significant investors in each other's narrative. And as near neighbours, chances are, and the hopes are, that we will continue to be economically, culturally, socially, politically intertwined in a more relaxed way, in a happier way, in a more forgiving and more generous way than history has ever allowed us to be or we have ever, ever allowed history let us be. Shaw himself intuited um, the changes that were coming down the line He's, he observed, and quite a long time back, he said, talking of his own generation, he said, 
We belong to a fortunate generation for the complications of history which have so often in the past bedeviled relationships between Ireland and its closest neighbour have begun to mature into a collegial and respectful friendship. This man whose life spanned immediate post-famine Ireland and immediate post-Second World War Britain was, I think, perhaps just a little bit premature in that judgment. But he was probably no more than that. I think he probably had a kind of intuitive prescience of things that were stirring. The push towards democratization, the opening up of universities, the opening up of education that was changing both our countries forever. And so oh, that's all he was. He was premature. He probably was not mistaken in his day with his finger on pulses that no one else even knew there were pulses to be, to be felt. He probably saw this juggernaut coming long before the rest of us ever felt its weight. And we know that the juggernaut of history takes a very, very long time uh, to slow down and to stop and to change direction. But I think that he intuited that. Happily, I think it has changed direction in this generation. I think that we can say with real justification that we are now that very fortunate generation. And here in this place of scholarship, with its motto, uh, to understand the causes of things, rerum conoscere causas, um, where the wording above the Fabian window that I mentioned exhorts us to remold the world nearer to the heart's desire. I think we can say that the one-time founder or co-founder of LSE would indeed be much more convinced today um, that the land of his birth and the land um, that he loved as his adopted homeland are much closer in friendship, much nearer in collegiality today than they have ever been in terms of their history. That relationship, that happy, respectful relationship, that good neighborliness, so absent from the sweep of our intertwined histories, I believe is the salient most distinguished and distinguishing characteristic of the present narratives of both our countries. It's also, I hope, going to be the source of energy and the continuing source of energy, which when harnessed well, will allow both Britain and Ireland through their people, through the lived lives of people like us, through the lives of, that are worked out at the level of politics, please goodness it will help us to construct the very, very best shared narratives yet. Thank you so much for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. Keep them easy. Thank you. the reaction of the audience to your words, which are very welcome and wonderfully presented to us. The President has agreed to take some questions um, and ask everybody to recognize who has a question that the President is above politics, so some questions may be difficult to answer. But having said that, uh, let me open the floor to taking questions. There are um, people around with, um, with microphones hand them to you. Have I, have I got anybody who would like to ask a, a question or make a comment? One up, up above, yes. In the middle. Thank you. Um, good evening, Miss President. Good evening. My name is Dave McCauley from Down Paddock in Northern Ireland. Um, what do you think of the prospect of a united Ireland in the future? <laughs> you know, just before I finished up, I said, keep the questions easy. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Can I just tell you just simply where the context of it is? Obviously, um, those, of, uh, those of us um, who live south of the border have in our constitution an ambition, and those of us who are um, Irish nationalists have an ambition for a united Ireland. And it's a very legitimate uh, and, I think, a noble ambition. And there are those who do not share that ambition on the island of Ireland. They wish for the independence of the limited Britain. 
And in and through the Good Friday Agreement, of course, one of the greatest arguments that um, developed in Ireland was the way in which that conflict of, uh, of ambition uh, worked out, um, was worked out through violence. Um, and that was never, ever going to be a noble way of working anything or, um, or a humanly dignified or decent way of working anything out. And um, so the Good Friday Agreement now sets those two ambitions um, into a, a lovely structured context. And what it says is, for as long as the people of Northern Ireland wish to remain um, part of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom, that is how things will be. If they ever change their minds about that, and that will be tested from time to time by a referendum, if that day dawns, then both governments are committed to working also um, to achieve their new ambition. And so these two ambitions, one for United Ireland, one for remain within the United Kingdom, these are two legitimate ambitions which I think will be talked about, will be argued about, people will argue the talk, but that's all they'll do. They'll argue and debate them. They won't kill each other over them. They'll argue and debate them. And I personally would love to think that at some time we will have a reconciled Ireland. And I think that long before you could ever have a united Ireland in the political sense in, the, uh, in which you mentioned, you have to have a reconciliation of hearts and minds. People have to be comfortable. People have to be comfortable. They have to feel included. They have to feel wanted. They have to feel understood. So there's quite a bit of work to be done there. I'd like to think that day might dawn. Don't ask me when, because I do not know. But I'm so happy to belong to a generation that has found a decent, a humanly decent structure for that debate uh, to continue in without frightening anybody or threatening or menacing anybody. Thank you. This gentleman up here with his hand raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam President, earlier this year, I, I had the uh, privilege of witnessing a debate, a discussion between uh, Patrick McGee, the Brighton bomber, and one of his victims, Harvey Thomas. In that line, do you believe that a South African-style Truth and Reconciliation Commission has anything to commend itself? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that's a really very big current question in Northern Ireland. I'm not going to answer it with a yes or no because it's not for me to say, but there is currently a body in Northern Ireland that has been taking very, very, very widespread soundings. Lord Eames is heading up that body, <coughs> and Dennis Bradley and a few others besides who are uh, his co-workers in that regard. I don't believe they have an easy task at all, but they are looking at how they can best deal with the issue of hurt, of loss, of memory, of vindication, of victimhood. And I think many of us are awaiting um, the results of their collaborations, uh, their very wide consultations. We're very interested to see, because really at the end of the day, it's not for me to say, one human being to say, I think whatever response again comes um, in response to that, I think it has to come from the people. It has to be those who have suffered deepest need to say what it is they need uh, to feel uh, vindicated and comfortable enough to move forward or move beyond their grief and loss, if that is even humanly possible. So uh, that's, that's a question that is currently out there and, and, and certainly very, um, you know, very genuine attempts being made to answer it. There's another gentleman up here wearing green. Very appropriate. Najib Kakar, originally Afghan from Pakistan, ethnic Pashtun origin. Quite similar to the Irish situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a few of us around. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask you, before Good Friday Agreement, the people who fought for the Irish cause in the UK, they were famous as terrorists. I'm just trying to find out whether the impact on the Irish nationality or on the Irish race does exist today or not. Also, Irish didn't sign the Lisbon Treaty because they, in my opinion, wanted to draw the attention of the whole European Union that Ireland does exist today as an independent state and behind that there was nothing else um, to say subjectively that um, Ireland disagree with the Lisbon Treaty. Your comments, please. Yes, uh, the area of the Lisbon Treaty is one that I am not permitted to speak on. As president, that's one of the areas I cannot get into. Uh, it won't stop Peter, I'm sure. Oh. It <laughs> <laughs> but it'll certainly stop me. Um, uh, as you know, our government at the moment is um, in, in negotiations.
negotiations with our colleagues in the European Union, having gone back to the people to try and ascertain what were the causes of the um, disquiet, uh, the manifest and serious disquiet, judging by the significant level of no vote, um, what, were, what were the reasons? They've come up with a number of reasons. Um, I can't say then how that will be handled downstream because, first of all, the government has not yet decided how it will be handled downstream, but it's entirely inappropriate for me to comment on it. As to the first question about the nature of terrorism, um, I think that through um, one of the things that we have discovered um, um, through conflict um, is that, uh, you know, history is, a v history is just so extraordinarily complicated. Um, for example, one of the lovely events that we had in Ireland um, was the 90th anniversary. We, for the first time ever, uh, we held an official commemoration of the 90th anniversary of the Battle of the Somme, in which so many Irish volunteers died. Uh, it was the first time we had done that. Um, we did that in the year 2006. And that was also the 90th anniversary, of course, of the Easter Rising. And the Easter Rising, um, we also regard as a heroic sacrifice by those who stood um, against a much, much stronger uh, opponent in order to achieve Irish independence. And so they are the heroes of modern Ireland. And subsequently, there are those who make connections to those heroes um, who claim a direct line of descent from them. Some of them are people who are utterly opposed to violence, and some of them are people who continue in the culture of violent conflict. And uh, for those of us, I can speak for myself, and here I'll speak personally. Um, I lived in Belfast and grew up in Belfast. I grew up uh, in a very difficult area of Belfast known as Ardoin. Some of my friends, as a result of events, some of the people that I knew, as a result of events that happened, they chose the path of violence. I could never, ever have done that. It just, I could not have done that. At a human level, something in me would never have allowed me to inflict that hurt or that pain on another human being. And frankly, I would regard myself as every bit a committed Irish nationalist as those who did use violence. And here, all these years later, I can safely say that I think that, that they <coughs> managed to put off the day of a united Ireland, that that hurt, that bitterness, that fighting, that conflict, it, it provoked such loss, such hurt. It contributed to the ongoing culture of mutual distrust and mutual incomprehension. And it gave us a much, much bigger mountain to climb in terms of reconciliation. So how we reconcile those things, you know, that'll be the PhD guys way down the line will do all of that. In the meantime, we just try to climb the mountain we were landed with, frankly. Yes. <laughs> There's two questions here. This gentleman with his hand up, and the other one at the back, and then here the first one. This is the one remarkable you're still not mentioning your font. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I was wondering, do you feel that the uh, success that Ireland and the United Kingdom had in the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent negotiations gives these two countries a special role to play in pointing the way towards reconciliation in other parts of the globe? Thank you for that question. It's one that I think is often asked and one that we ask ourselves. And in response to it, our government has set up, within the Department of Foreign Affairs, it's set up um, a conflict resolution unit. Uh, with the precise purpose of taking whatever distilled wisdom we have from our long drawn out process and offering it, but offering it very humbly, not in a prescriptive way to other people who are struggling like we did for so long to find our way through that morass um, of human hatred and bitterness and all those things that get in the way um, of, at the end of the day, what looks so obvious. Why would you want to stay mired <coughs> in violence why would you want to stay mired in poverty? Why would you want to stay mired in lack of progress? But somehow the human dynamic, the human hatred, is just can be at times overwhelming. And it's very hard to penetrate to the kind of yesness that's in people because loss and anger constantly brings out the hard no. And I'd like to think that maybe we have something in that regard to offer. We've learned how to get to the yesness that I think is in most human beings. 
Most human beings do not want hassle for their kids. They don't want their kids to grow up in violence and conflict. They don't want them to have to worry about walking the streets you know, as potential victims of sectarian or racist crime. Who wants that for their children? But just getting from what they would want and what they would like to where they're at is such a big, big mountain to climb. And so we are often, we have appointed our first ambassador, our first special envoy, in the way that the Americans helped us with their special envoys, in particular George Mitchell, of course, who was crucial, utterly crucial to the process. I mean, I'd never be uh, lacking in humility enough to suggest, um, uh, or to suggest that, um, that, that the Irish and British government solved this on their own. For sure we did not. Um, it took all the people north and south. It took a lot of friends around the world, in particular our friends in the United States. And so we've appointed an ambassador to East Timor, Timor-Leste, um, which is a wonderful woman, Dame Lula Olone, who conducted a wonderful, did a wonderful and very, very difficult job in Northern Ireland um, as police ombudsperson. And um, so she, uh, we're hoping, will be able to help take our distilled wisdom for what it's worth and offer it elsewhere. I think that we have a vocation to do that. You know, If there's anything that we have learnt that is transferable, then we ought to do that. We shouldn't keep those golden nuggets to ourselves because there are so many other people who are still just mired in outrageous conflict. And so I think, yes, I, I do think that we have something to offer, but you know, every, we don't have a template. I don't think we have a template, I wish we did. I don't think we've got a template. We have things that worked and we have things that didn't work and we've an awful lot of failures as well that people can learn possibly as much from as our successes, frankly. Um, so. I, but I think that we have, I think we're honor bound to try and share what we've learned. Thank you. This gentleman here, please. Uh, Madam President, good evening and welcome to uh, our meets. My question is very simple to you. We've had um, ten, nearly 10 years of the Good Friday Agreement. What next? Yes. I think now, and particularly, it's wonderful to be talking about this in this week um, when our Taoiseach was able to say that the last piece of the jigsaw puzzle is now in place. Now, I think, um, we begin to see the potential of partnership in Northern Ireland within, between the two communities um, start to reveal itself. The potential of cross-border partnership begin to reveal itself. And already the partnership, the potential of the partnership on the east-west axis has already revealed itself quite powerfully. I mean, what you're going to have for the future in Northern Ireland, instead of people going toe-to-toe -to -toe with one another, as they did for so long, now these people are going to stand shoulder to shoulder in government. I mean, it's a remarkable thing. Members of Sinn Féin, now in government with members of the DUP. If somebody had told me that this was going to happen a few years ago, I would have said, don't think so. Maybe sometime, not my lifetime. Here it is, it's on our doorstep. They're doing an extraordinarily courageous thing for them to do, given the perspectives they both come from and the constituencies they come from. Because you know, in negotiations, sometimes it's easier to negotiate with the, your opponent. Then you've got to go back and bring your constituency and negotiate with them as well and bring them with you. So they have a lot of work to do. And I think now this week we have seen the results. It's taken them five months to get to the, this point of breakthrough. Some people get very frustrated with that and, and did get very frustrated with it, but actually, I think now when I look at it, that tells us just how difficult a struggle it was and, and how convincing a moment we are now in that they have been able to do this. It now gives us great hope that so many of the other things that are on their agenda that we know are also quite troubling and difficult, education, um, uh, all those other big issues, the Irish language issue, the issue to do with loyalist decommissioning and all of those things, it gives us great hope that they will now find um, the creativity and the imagination and importantly the sense of, I, I think what's happening, that the sense of common trust. Somebody did once say you know, that um, it's, it's, it's distrust that gets in the way of common interests, you know, of mutual interests. Mutual, mutual trust is essential and I think what we've seen is a growth in that mutual trust and hopefully that will flourish and where that flourishes only good can come. I think we'll take one, well, perhaps two more, because I will now see a forest of hands going up. <laughs> this lady, this lady up here. So I, I'm got going to ask you to restrict it to a short, brief interjection. Yes. Uh, thank you, President. Um, Susan Norris, just a, just a quick question. How do you see the relationship between Ireland and the US 
given the new president in the US, President Obama, the relationship between Ireland and the US, and perhaps if you want to comment on the relationship between the US and globally after the President Obama's election. Thank, thank you. you for that question. Or maybe I'm, going just take, I'm going to take two or three questions together, so thank you for that. Thank you. There's another question over here, a lady up here at the back. Three or four rows, right? Yeah, thank you. And then I'm going to take one other question, this question up here, and that'll be it. Thank you. I'm from South Derry. I'd just like to ask uh, Madam President, um, I was very touched by what you say about not knowing your neighbors, and I wondered what you thought of the role of um, children from different religions attending the similar school, because I think there's almost like two communities within Northern Ireland, and if they knew each other younger, do you think that would be a solution to, to really uh, not having issues going forward? Thank you. And up at the back. I'm sorry that I have to restrict you to this, but I'll just take one final question. Thank you. you. You spoke on how uh, violence has um, at least delayed uh, the construction of peace. C could you comment on Afghanistan and, and Iraq, perhaps? Oh, certainly. <laughs> In about 30 seconds, of course. <laughs> well, can I work my way through those very promptly? Um, the first one, the um, United States and Irish relationship and the recent election of Barack Obama I think the, the election of Barack Obama is one of the most remarkable uh, and uh, extraordinary events, and it's so a great hope-filled event. Um, not just, I have to say, for Irish-U.S. Uh, relationships, but I think for relation for the United States, the United States and the world. I think it puts racism on the run. I, I just, I think, on so many levels, um, it's it, it really is, you know, from the log cabin to the White House. You know, you can you begin to believe in that American dream in a very special way, and. Um, of course, it's also from County Offaly. You do know that, <laughs> and, um, which explains everything. Uh, we can't wait to get him to County Offaly because, of course, as it happens, by a happy coincidence, our Taoiseach is from County Offaly. So here we have these two Offaly men in these wonderful positions. <laughs> you know, God is good, and he's obviously an Offaly God. And, um, and, uh, and we've, we've, we've always a great relationship with the United States. We see that relationship flourishing under uh, President-elect Obama when he comes into office. We can't wait um, to get the opportunity to really get to know him, get to know his administration. Previous administrations in the United States have been phenomenal friends to Ireland. I don't think, um, Ireland, has, Ireland has just got in the United States a really, really great, true, tried, tested, trusted friend. 45 million people in the United States claim Irish background and um, uh, Irish identity, and that's a pretty big family uh, to have, and they've always been very good clan to us. So I'm very, very hopeful. On the question of children and not knowing your neighbours, you know, I think that's one of the most profound issues to be dealt with in Northern Ireland going forward. Not just at the level of children, but the whole issue of sectarianism. It's a very, very divided community. Most people live separately. They live in areas that are defined along religious and political identifiable grounds. That's not a good way to get to know your neighbours because you're living inside you know, a hermetically sealed bubble where the only people you meet are people who agree with you, think the same as you, go to the same church, go to the same political parties. That has to be addressed. And I grew up as, um, in, in, a, uh, in a, what's called a mixed area. Actually, I grew up in an area that was predominantly Protestant. All of my friends growing up were from a Protestant background, and I always thanked them. I'm very, very grateful for that, because I think it gave me insights um, um, that were very, very useful for me later in life, um, and understandings uh, much, uh, and also the gift <coughs> of the friendship. But, um, you do need, you do need a chance to be friends. You do need to know one another. But somehow we, even, even in places where we did mix, almost as a courtesy to one another and out of fear of trampling on each other's neuralgic sensitivities, we very often did not get deeply into conversations that would have opened up to each other our thinking. Um, and I think in that way we remained, even, even people who were great friends and good neighbours to one another, um, found these issues, the issues that divided us, found them too hot to handle, close up and personal. And I think now, actually, ironically, I think now we will find them easier to deal with because we have frameworks for dealing with them. And they aren't necessarily going to lead to argument and violence and breakdown. So I'd like to think that, please God, we, you know, 
with working on this, on the, the anti-sectarian agenda is very, very important going forward. We've all got to work on that. Every one of us got to help out there. Afghanistan and Iraq, God, I wish I had an answer. Gee, you know, I, I honest to God wish I had, I had the sim simplest answer to that. I, also, I do think here are parts of the world that um, we simply do not know. Here are cultures that we do not know. Here's what happens. Here is what happens when people, and, and including neighbors within uh, those countries, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, do not get to know one another. When we allow a situation of them and us to develop and do not get to know one another, um, I think we have to confer on each other the dignity of dialogue, really, really intensive dialogue. Um, the, the world really um, suffers grievously when we fall into that them and us, us and them. Um, it happened on the streets that I grew up in. It happened very, very easily indeed. Uh, I know the president of Kosovo is coming here, I think is it tomorrow or the next day? And he can tell you of his, the streets of, uh, of his capital city also, exactly the same story. And um, you know, we, we suffer grievously when we live in ignorance of one another. And when we do not confer on others the right to be different. And in conferring on them the right to be different, also confer on ourselves the right also to be different, but to bridge those differences with dialogue. That's what I hope for. Um, I'm very, very hopeful, please, Gugan, that, that Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran will become resolved problems rather than ongoing problems. Well, President, um, on behalf of everybody here, I would like to say a couple of words to you. I think that you have demonstrated clearly that we are no petty people. And it's not a lack of humility that leads me to saying that, because you have been, by acclaim, continued in office by the Irish people precisely because of the points of view which you have expressed with such complete clarity here today. Uh, a clarity, incidentally, I cannot avoid the opportunity to say that notwithstanding any illusion that may have been the result of the outcome of the Lisbon Treaty, we are not a petty people. <laughs> we did not reject it because of an outmoded view on sovereignty. In fact, 83% of the Irish people in the last Eurobarometer poll said that European integration was a good thing, which is in marked contrast, I should say, with some other places not too far from here. <laughs> but of course, that would be a low blow. And, um, but coming back to the serious point that I was making, we're very proud of our president, as I told you when I introduced her. And I would ask you to show your appreciation in the usual way the magnificent address that she gave and the questions she answered.